A reading from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted in you, and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you... Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Steve, and good morning, everyone. My name is Laurel, and I am a member of the teaching team here at the Meeting Place. Happy to be enjoying the summer of 66 with you where we are cruising through the 66 books of the Bible and exploring how they connect to Jesus. And when I heard we'd be doing this, uh, I was pleased because biblical literacy is something that's really close to my heart and something that I believe is starting to fade in our general population. And that does not bode well for society. Um, <clears throat> Theodore Roosevelt said, a thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. And the Bible has influenced so much throughout the ages it has helped shape modern literature, democracy, healthcare, human rights, law, and so much more. But above all else, the overarching story of God seeking to reconcile us to himself through Christ is the story that stands to make the most impact in each of our lives as we choose to calibrate ourselves to this bigger story that we are all a part of. Hence, the summer of 66. 
And we've been looking at the 66 books of the Bible in their thematic groupings uh, that we find them organized in in the Bible. And I just have a graphic for us to look at to show a quick rewind of what we've covered so far. So in the first two weeks, we covered the books of the law covered by Bob and Precious. The next two weeks, we learned about the 12 books of history covered by Pastor Ryan and Pastor Nicole. And last week, Scott introduced us to the beloved and widely read five books of poetry. And he shared that actually 30% of the Bible consists of poetry, which I found very interesting. And these poetry books are also known as the wisdom books. And this Sunday, we'll be looking more closely into these wisdom books and how they connect to the person of Jesus. Here are the books again for review. The poetry wisdom books are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. And we'll learn how they connect to Jesus book by book. And we will save the book of Psalms for last because that's where we'll be spending the most time this morning. We will start with what is believed to be the oldest book in the Bible, and that is the book of Job. This book was written in poetic form, and it tells the fascinating, dramatic story of Job and records the intense conversations that he had with his friends and with God during it. So a quick rewind from last week. Job was a person of great riches and righteousness. Satan opposes him, and he suffers tremendous loss of his wealth, his children, his health, almost to the point of losing his life. He's abandoned by his friends who judge him unjustly. He's even mocked. But then, after God puts every opinionated person back in their place, Job's health, riches, and relationships are restored to him in even greater measure than before. Parallels can be drawn between the person of Job and the person of Jesus, with Jesus being a clear level up. Let's take a look. Job was considered rich and righteous. Jesus is the son of God. It does not get richer than that. And Jesus, unlike Job, is perfect in righteousness. Job was opposed by Satan and suffered almost to the point of losing his life. Jesus was opposed by Satan and the religious leaders and suffered to the point of losing his life. Both were abandoned by their friends. Both suffered unjust judgment and mockery. Job's health and riches were restored to him in the end. Jesus was resurrected completely and restored to gl the glory he had in heaven, seated at the right hand of God. Plus, Jesus was granted the worship of the multitudes who've put their faith in him since, which we've been doing this morning. What I think is especially powerful, though, is that while Job was going through everything he was going through, terrible loss and suffering, compounded by the judgment and rejection of his friends, he believed that he had an advocate in heaven before God, interceding for him. Let's read what he said. Even now, my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend. As in my eyes, <laughs> as my eyes pour out tears to God, on behalf of a man, he pleads with God as one pleads for his friend. Again, we don't know when Job was written. It could have been 1,000 or 2,000 years before the coming of Christ to earth. But even then, Job knew deep in his spirit that there was someone advocating for him before God in heaven. I love that because the book of Romans chapter 8 says that Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us. The book of 1 John chapter 2 says that Jesus is is our advocate with the Father. The book of Hebrews chapter 7 says, Jesus always lives to intercede for us. Listen to this other declaration that Job makes. Again, in the middle of his suffering, he says, 
I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Do you share his yearning? Any one of us can make this declaration at any point in our lives, in the hardest of times or in the best of times, declaring that our Redeemer lives, that in the end, he will stand on the earth and we will see God with our own eyes. And thank you, Job, for pointing this out to us. The next book, Proverbs. Proverbs is a collection of poems and wise sayings compiled for us to reference often. The Bible Project describes Proverbs as a guide for living wisely and well in God's good world. A quick rewind about Proverbs. In four of the poems, wisdom is personified as a woman inviting everyone who is foolish to come to her and get wisdom. And throughout Proverbs, the pitfalls of sin and the benefits of righteousness are highlighted, and wisdom helps us to navigate these. Wisdom is seen as something woven into the fabric of the universe, and when we ignore it, we ignore it to our own peril. So, how does this connect to Jesus? Scripture says Jesus is wisdom from God in human form. Let's read. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. And again, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2, verses 2 to 3. So, in Proverbs, we have wisdom personified as a woman inviting all who are foolish to come to her. In Jesus, we have a wisdom literally personified inviting all who are sinful to come to him. And foolishness and sinfulness are closely linked throughout scripture as one often leads to the other and both are in opposition to righteousness. The good news is, is that Jesus not only imparts, freely imparts his wisdom to those who seek him, but also his righteousness. <laughs> If the wisdom books are a written guide for us on how to live wisely and well in God's good world, then Jesus is our personal guide through whose example and through whose relationship with us we can be guided on how to live wisely and well in this good world, especially as he's given us the Holy Spirit who is ever present for us to ask for wisdom at any time, and he makes it available to us. We are moving fast on to the next book, the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes dives deep into some serious philosophical questions worthy of our time, and they were explored by its author, presumed to be King Solomon, who was believed to be one of the wealthiest and wisest people of ancient times. In the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon sought the meaning and purpose of life. He highlighted the vanity and temporal pleasure of living just for yourself, either through working really hard or through hedonism, because he concludes, after all, you will just die in the end. Jesus, however, brought the meaning and purpose of life with him in the good news. He reminds us that we are here for God and God's purposes. 
Whereas Solomon highlighted the vanity and meaninglessness of living for yourself, Jesus calls us to the greater purpose of living to promote God's kingdom, to participate in the bigger story of God, reconciling us to and all creation to himself. Whereas Ecclesiastes has a depressing tone of, after all, we're just going to die, Jesus' good news resounds with the promise that in him we will never die. This life is not all there is, and eternal life is promised in him. So in this way, Ecclesiastes paints a dark backdrop of the meaninglessness of life outside of reverent connection to God. And that makes the good news of Jesus shine all the more brightly. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. They being those who choose to follow him and enter this abundant life that he makes possible. Another book attributed to King Solomon, but not entirely agreed upon as him being the author, is the book of Song of Songs. Song of Songs is eight chapters of love poems between a lover and her beloved, and vice versa, back and forth, back and forth, the love songs go. It shows the great lengths a lover goes to in pursuing his beloved and as they both care for each other so intensely. And for this reason, Song of Songs is considered by some theologians to be an allegory of Jesus' deep love for and pursuit of the Bride of Christ, the Church. However, more recently, theologians seem to be saying that, you know, Song of Songs could actually just be a love poem, celebrating the beauty, joy, and desire of love between two engaged and later married lovers. So as not to involve myself in theological complexities involving racy love poems, to this I will simply say, yes. <laughs> Jesus does love us more deeply than could ever be expressed between two people on earth, and yes, he has gone to great lengths to communicate this love for us, and still does. His love supersedes that of any human love and is a love worthy of our wholehearted response. We will leave it there. Moving right along, <laughs> this brings us to the last book of poetry wisdom literature that we will discuss today, which is the book of Psalms. In my years teaching children's ministry, I've always taught that if you open your Bible to the very middle, you will likely find yourself in the book of Psalms. And very often to this day, when I open my Bible, that's usually where I start. Because if you read around Psalms, it usually doesn't take long to find something that will resonate with you. And that is because Psalms are songs representative of a wide spectrum of human emotions and experience. As a human, Jesus himself engaged in a broad spectrum of human emotion and experience. And on occasion, Jesus would quote or reference the Psalms as they would be very familiar to his Jewish listeners. The Psalms were essentially their prayer book. The Psalms include songs of what has happened in the past, songs of what will happen in the future, anticipating what will happen. Several psalms speak of the coming of the Messiah, the Christ who will save and rule over all. And after he rose from the dead, Jesus appeared to his disciples in the upper room and he reminded them how he had told them that all things that were written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the psalms had to be fulfilled that were concerning him. And it's important to remember that the psalms are songs. Some psalms even begin with a note indicating the specific tune that they are to be sung to. 
And this is smart because when you set something to music, you're more likely to remember it. it. It worked for me as a child, and I still see it at work in children's ministry today. Melody and memory go together. I don't know how many people sat around last weekend in groups listening to poetry, but I do know that last weekend there were record-breaking numbers of people sitting around in groups listening to poetry set to music at Folk Fest. And I was there for the first time ever last weekend to see what I've been missing for the last 32 years. And it is quite the gathering. Songs gather people together and are a great medium for getting a message across, expressing emotion or sharing stories. Words set to melody just seem to stick in your head such that sometimes you find yourself memorizing them without even trying. I will prove it now. I will sing the first part of a song, and when I point to you, you sing the next phrase. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> hmm. Oh, when I look back now, that summer seemed to last forever. And if I had a choice, yeah, I'd always want to be there. Kind of like the summer of 66. Yes, it was only, it was actually only until just after the Middle Ages that the Psalms were organized into chapters and verse. So prior to that, whenever referring to a psalm, a rabbi would only have to sing the beginning of a psalm in order to bring the entire psalm to mind for his listeners. And this brings us to the psalm that Steve read to us this morning, the psalm I'd like us to take a moment to look at, which although it was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born, it has many compelling parallels detailing what Jesus would experience on the cross. It is Psalm 22. And this psalm is kind of a hybrid because it starts out as a psalm of lament, but it ends as a psalm of praise. Here we go. Let's look at how it begins. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? And this first phrase may seem familiar to you because it's the same phrase that Jesus cried out in anguish while hanging on the cross. Let's read. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this cry alone is the topic of much theological discussion, wondering, did God completely forsake Jesus in that moment he took all of the sin of the world onto himself? Or was Jesus crying out the first verse of Psalm 22 so that his onlookers, familiar with that psalm, would complete the psalm in their head and realize that Psalm 22 was actually a prophecy being fulfilled right before their eyes. Let's read more in verse 7 and 8. It says, All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Let's read what it says. In Matthew 27, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Again, striking parallels. There's more in verse 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. 
My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet. In the crucifixion story, in the Gospel of John, it says, now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. On the cross, Jesus was literally poured out like water. He suffered thirst, and his hands and feet were pierced. All of these experiences were outlined in the Psalms hundreds of years before it happened to Jesus. And there's more. Verse 17 and 18. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Now I see, now we can see what the Gospel of John says. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happens that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Down to these little details, Jesus' crucifixion experience seems to be closely pre-drawn by this psalm written so long ago. And what I find especially impactful is how this psalm ends. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. These verses point to the future. Future generations who will be told of Christ future generations who will proclaim his righteousness because he has done it. Let's read. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. He has done it. In this psalm, and in so many other ways, the books of wisdom and poetry in the Bible point us to Jesus. It points us to his wisdom, his love, his death, his resurrection, and his glorious return. All of that is to be found here. And when we read the books of poetry and wisdom, we are reading the very text that Jesus himself read and studied and memorized and, I believe, quoted from the cross, leaving us to finish the song that he started, not just in words, but with our lives, until he comes again. Amen. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom around poetry and wisdom. <laughs> um, we actually had quite a few people saying just a general thank you to you that everybody started off with thanks uh, a lot. So the first one here, it says, thanks, Laurel, for your words this morning. You made compelling connections between the books of poetry and Jesus. How does it matter to us that there are these connections? And how can I make that matter in my life this week? 
you know, just, oh, if you want to sum summarize <laughs> everything that you just talked about. Let me do some stretches first. <laughs> okay. Um, so, why does it matter to make those connections? And how can we... And, and then I think just a general, they said, how can that matter in my life this week? So, I think just a general life application just a general, of that knowledge. Like, I, first of all, uh, I love the Bible Project, which is available online. And they always talk that the Bible is one unified story uh, that points us to Jesus. And it's leading somewhere. And the story's not finished yet. But whenever we sit down to read the Bible, we should come prayerfully um, submitted to God being God and us not being God and ask God, what can you reveal to me about your character? And what can you reveal to me about my character in light of that? But Jesus being God in the flesh um, is our example of what um, living in that close relationship with God looks like and of the impact that it can have and, and in advancing God's kingdom. So he's our, our concrete example. And so whatever, wherever we read in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, how it reflects God's character and his ways, are, those are all manifested in the person of Jesus. And so Jesus is a great starting point for wanting to be like God, but we can also extract his his qualities and his character through anywhere in the Bible, wherever we're reading, believing that, yeah, he's there um, when we ask, our, ask him to reveal himself to us through his living word when we open it. It's a yeah. tough question. You can go it with is. an easier well, one now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this wasn't my question, but uh, I didn't write one in. Just in but the book of Psalms particularly, um, for me, is a very big spiritual home. I find anytime I'm having problems reading elsewhere, personally, mm -hmm. I always just return to the Psalms mm -hmm. because there's so much of human experience that I can relate to there. And there's a lot of times where it's just like crying out to God from this human experience. And so personally, I always find comfort there. Mm -hmm. And that's a place for me that I always find just like a restart. Um, that's, that's sort of my base is there within those, those poetic areas. Um, second question here. Thank you, Laurel. I agree that melody and poetry certainly has a power to help us carry knowledge and teaching. However, I often find my mind and heart carry all kinds of tunes, and I find myself replaying a variety of songs and sentiments. Sorry, I don't know if this is going to be an easier question, so get ready. Listen. Short of strict restrictions and avoiding worldly music, what has helped you in seeking to carry God's knowledge and love through song? So I think sort of what is your personal experience here? In carrying God's knowledge and love through song. So if anything's true, it's going to resonate with God's truth. And I love how throughout history and throughout the arts especially, God has woven his glory and his beauty and his truth. And, and you can often find and extract that from many, many things. For me personally in navigating that whole world, it's true, when something's put to music, it's in your head, and that's for better or for worse. Like, when Gangnam Style was big, I couldn't get it out of my head, and it was driving me crazy. Um, but, but then you can override it with having some songs in your portfolio to sing to yourself over that and sing what is true. I tell my kids, I don't want to be like all legalistic, like don't listen to that. I, I tell them though to be discerning because whatever you consume is becoming a part of you. Just like you eat something and it becomes a part of you, whatever you consume through your eyes and through your ears, you're foolish if you think it's not becoming a part of you. And we are to be discerning. And is the Holy Spirit in you comfortable with that? Are you bringing the Holy Spirit with you into what you're listening and what you're watching? And do you feel his blessing and release to, um, to watch and listen to those things? Because everything we do is either moving us towards um, conforming to the image of Christ, or it's deforming us from the image of Christ. And the, the stakes are high. So look for God and good in all things. We can find him. But also be discerning as to what you consume as, as God's child. Mm -hmm. 
That's my mom speech. I think my mom would very much agree with you because uh, I know for myself a lot of the songs and stuff that my mom shared with us when we were young. Those are still in my head. I mean, if I look for a book of the Bible, I'm still going, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, <laughs> right? Like, so those, those songs, they, they stick with you, I almost feel, longer than a lot of the other things. Absolutely. And if you ever think you're not capable of learning all, memorizing all the books of the Bible in order, I encourage you to Google a song that sings them all like you still know because you can totally get it and there's no other way, in my opinion, to learn the books of the Bible other than in song. <laughs> and there's so many scriptures as well that are just set to song and it's embedded in the hymns and it's, there's scripture in the songs we sing as well. So. I've got one more question, and I'm having a hard time unlocking the phone. <laughs> Give me a second. Ah, oh, got it. Here we go. Um, this, sorry, I'm not, I'm not giving you softballs here. If the Psalms are the prayer book, why do Jewish people not believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Yes. So, sorry. <laughs> no, I came across that, and I, the Internet is is fascinating because I was watching rabbis talk about this and talk about how we hijack the Psalms and say, that's about Jesus, that's about Jesus, that's about Jesus, that's about Jesus, that's about Jesus. And I'm like, ouch, that must be hard to have the sacred book hijacked by another closely related faith and saying this is all about Jesus. Um, I have some good friends who are Jewish and I'm curious to know, I don't know if and when that's going to come up in conversation, curious to know what they would think about that, because you can project your truth onto anything and, and tease it out of there, but the person of Jesus, has, the historical person of Jesus, and the undeni historically undeniable event of his crucifixion is just pretty powerful and all the subsequent events that happened to it the fact that we're sitting here today i looked at the back we've got people of chinese descent of indian descent of african descent all nations we're all here because of the person of jesus um, that speaks and and i do believe that um, when i read the psalms and the other books of the torah uh, i do see it resonating with the person of Christ. Faith is a gift. Faith is a gift. And there are many Jewish people who've come to know Jesus as Messiah. And there's lots of stuff online of people, Jewish people, who've come to know Jesus as Messiah, teaching on this very psalm. And I watched that, and I found that fascinating, just that extra level they would have of insight into the fulfillment of it. So I am... Um, yeah, let's, Bible says to, to pray, and let's pray for our Jewish brothers and sisters um, that God would open the eyes of their heart and that the little bits they've picked up in maybe brushing up against Christian culture, they'd be like, wait a minute, this does sound like the person of Jesus that my friend follows. Um, yeah, Lord, lead us into all truth. <laughs> Thank you so much for your responses there, Laurel. Could Thank you close you. us? I will close you with a blessing. I open the book of Psalms backstage, and I'm like, oh, here's a blessing. Psalm 67, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. And my prayer for us is this week and beyond, may we be seekers of God's wisdom. May we seek to know better the source of all wisdom, becoming like him, that we may live wisely and well in God's good world until he returns. Amen. Go in peace. God bless you.